Have you tried to buy a house or rent a place recently? The housing market has gotten completely out of hand. Between people who can work remotely buying places in the suburbs to investors buying houses to protect their wealth from perceived runaway inflation. So with so much talk about affordable housing, what are we actually doing about it? Well, that's why I drove out in 118 degree weather to Las Vegas. I met with a fascinating startup called Boxable. Hey guys, this is Galliano Tiramani from Boxable here at our new factory. I want to say thank you so much uh, to Ricky for having me on your channel. If you want to learn more about Boxable, please check out our website, check out our YouTube. We are going to keep everyone updated on social media and we'll keep posting more and more videos of the action as this factory comes alive. Boxable builds modular houses that can easily be transported on flatbed trucks for a fraction of the price of building homes on site. So does Boxable finally have a blueprint for solving our affordable housing crisis? Also, if we can solve our housing issues here on Earth, might this also prove to be the strategy for starting to colonize Mars? Yeah, this video isn't just about solving housing here on Earth. We're going interplanetary on our deep dive this week here on To The Da Vinci. Special thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Feed your curiosity for math and science with the link in the description. There's an analogy floating around the interweb that goes something like this. Imagine if you go online and buy a Tesla, then a few months later, a few guys show up with a tool belt full of tools and heaps of metal and welding tools and start sawing and banging away and handcrafting your car in your driveway. As absurd as all that sounds, this is exactly how we're building our houses today. In fact, Homes are probably the only thing in our lives that aren't automated and produced in a massive factory by the thousands. Sure, unlike laptops or cars, houses are massive and there's no possible way we could be building them inside of factories, is there? Well, that's exactly the mission statement of the modular home company, Boxable, who's got a novel idea. If buildings weren't so big, they would already be mass produced in a factory. The core reason they're not is just they're just way too big to ship. Traditional modular manufactured housing ships a wide load. Uh, uh, some other startups have some other solutions for it, which mainly are just shipping smaller eight foot room modules, which doesn't make sense for, from a couple perspectives. One, if you're gonna sell an eight foot room, that's not necessarily desirable. You're not gonna have a big market. It's not pleasant. And then uh, the other thing they'll do is they'll stitch multiple eight foot rooms together. But then you're back with a tremendous amount of site work. You know, when you're stitching open walls together on site, guess who's back? The electrician's back, the painter's back, the plumber, everyone. So, you know, we want to get away from that. When fully folded up, a boxable modular home has a similar footprint to a container house or a mobile home that can easily be transported on a standard flatbed truck. But in just a few hours, some unfolding magic and fasteners later, that eight and a half foot package transforms into a 20 foot wide house. Like most other modular home builders, Boxable lets you choose various lengths, with 20 by 20 being their smallest size. You could also opt for larger sizes up to 40 feet and eventually even 60 feet. Since one dimension is kept constant at 20 feet for their patented folding design, it means all their configurations will be easily transportable. Okay, so great packaging, but what other benefits are there? Well, for one, unlike other modular homes that once rooted to their foundation, require all the fixtures and kitchen to be installed, the Boxable House comes with everything you need already installed. I hope that you won't even need, you know, a, a drill or a screwdriver in the end. Um, I, I expect that these will be unfolded. We'll have little Allen keys. You know, you go around and you lock it in with an Allen key and, uh, and it's good to go. And then, you know, you, you bolt it to the foundation, you connect utilities on site, uh, potentially add a, a different roof solution. And, and that's it, you know, we, we want to make this user friendly. We want to make it more of a consumer product than uh, something that, you know, tradespeople would use. The secret lies in their folding methodology. Their first configuration is called the casita or small house in Spanish. This is the model we toured at their factory. And you can see that the kitchen and bathroom occupy the rear third of the house. All of that stays in place and the folding begins here. The remaining two thirds or so of both the left and the right sides then fold in. Next, the front of the house folds down into the floor and the combined floor front assembly folds up to form the last wall. To understand the benefits of modular homes built in factories, let's break this down to three categories. One, improvement in cost, reductions in waste and turnaround time. Two, improvements in structural strength and durability. Three, improvements in insulation and energy efficiency. 
First up, let's talk about improvements in cost. The typical home takes months to build, produces large amounts of waste, and costs significantly more than a modular home. Traditional homes, for one, have far more building waste. If you need to build a three-foot structure, odds are the contractors will be buying standard eight-foot lumber. And so this goes for all building materials. Building custom things with standard materials just creates significant amounts of waste. Before we get back to the show, let me tell you about our sponsor, Brilliant. You probably noticed I never miss an opportunity to explain stuff using science and engineering. Like, why are there so many triangles in bridge design? The answer lies in the scientific thinking course on Brilliant. In the structures class, you learn about rigid rods and fixed joints. Remember the various types of loading we talked about? Being resistant to shear loads is a major reason why triangles are so loved by engineers. I've also been brushing up on gears because, well, college was 15 years ago. Scientific knowledge is like a toolbox and understanding new principles like forces and gears are like tools. Collect enough tools and you'll be ready to make the next big engineering breakthrough or at least better understand the engineering design decisions all around us. Be one of the first 200 users to use my link, brilliant.org slash tuba da Vinci and save 20% on a yearly premium subscription with Brilliant. So don't wait, get started today. Secondly, traditional homes cost much more due to everything being one-off. Each house, even if they are a cookie cutter design, duplicated dozens of times in a community, is largely treated as a one-off project. Framing has to go up, then insulation installed, then electrical and plumbing, and so forth. Typical efficiencies that are gained in economies of scale never come into play. Sure, if you're building 100 homes, you can bulk purchase lumber and use similar flooring and cabinetry to reduce cost, but installation is still very much unique and custom. The average new car in the US costs around $40,000, which sounds like a lot of money, but if your car is built the way your house is, piece by piece, system by system in your garage, it would probably cost closer to $500,000. In terms of scheduling, traditional homes take much longer to complete because they are subject to weather delays. Also, a traditional home is very sequential, and delays while parts of the construction are completed are common. In contrast, modular homes are built in large condition factories, and work can be completed in two and even three shifts every day all year round. This factory should be 3,600 units per year on two shifts. Uh, 3,600 so, per yeah, year? Yeah, so it's like about 300 a month, and we'll see how that plays out in reality. I think we can do a little better than that, and I think that's a conservative estimate, but the, the uh, essentially one house should be coming off the assembly line every 90 minutes or so, and that means that it would stay at, at no single station for more than 90 minutes, so it can keep moving through. Uh, and then when you think about like what these stations are, I don't think anything is going to take that long once we get it dialed in. Additionally, modular construction is much easier to break up and build at the same time. All of this makes modular homes far more schedule efficient. And if our goal is large amounts of affordable housing, this is absolutely critical. So, yeah, so, you know, this is going to be the beginning of the assembly line. Uh, all the kind of raw materials will be, you know, uh, stacked up around here. Uh, pretty much all of those raw materials are uh, pre-cut by CNC and, and formed and, and uh, whatever the process is to very accurate precision subcomponents. Uh, so so they this can... is after all that? This is the, the start of the assembly process? Yeah, yeah. So, so where would the CNC cutting happen? Is it still in this factory? We do some, some of that stuff here and some of it gets brought in from a, a third party that does it. Um, like, so, you know, that's, that's some of the, uh, uh, well, actually in the corner over there is the, the CNC, but it's not set up just yet. It's got a tarp over it. It's all going to be stacked up here. And then this is, this is one of the really important pieces of equipment. Um, where basically uh, this is a conveyor table. Um, uh, initially, uh, these um, jib cranes are going to have uh, vacuum assisted lifters on them. So a guy can just, with little effort, pick it up and place it. And eventually, early on, that'll be replaced with a robot arm. Um, but not at first. We got to figure out the basics uh, first. And uh, yeah, so then they're just going to essentially lay out, uh, you know, for example, the, the exterior uh, wallboard. They'll lay it out here. Um, about uh, four, four feet wide each, so five pieces per, per 20 foot wall. And then this right here uh, extrudes polyurethane adhesive. And then uh, we have EPS foam, which is the core of the wall, which is uh, cut uh, precision by a, by a third party. Uh, we'll, we'll probably eventually bring that in house. That'll that be one of the- Is that the insulation part? Yeah, that's the insulation. Uh, it's insulation, it's also structural. On top of that is, is another uh, ceramic board for the interior wall. 
And then we also have some like PVC extrusions uh, that go around kind of around the perimeter. Those serve as uh, uh, an end cap to the panel, a uh, hinge where it folds, and then also a gasket so it can kind of seal up like a car door. So that's just a really nice process for, for assembling the, the wall panels quickly. And then uh, they eventually get fed into this right here. After the adhesive's applied, uh, it needs to cure uh, for a certain amount of time. While it's curing, it needs to... Um, Is vacuum? Uh, yeah, it needs to be under pressure so that it just held in place. So the cool thing about this particular piece of equipment that we have is this is actually four vacuum presses on top of each other. <laughs> I was about to ask you that. Yeah, so, so this will raise up and down and the panels will feed in. Um, so we can get two 20-foot panels uh, on, on each one and then uh, it'll just be a continuous throughput. Basically, three of the, the, the presses will be curing and one will just be getting loaded and unloaded. Let's switch gears and talk about how Boxable's building approach compares with traditional homes in terms of strength and durability. Traditional homes are typically built with bricks and mortar or wood framing. In seismically active California, the flexibility and bendability of wood construction is a must. Historically, homes are built with two by four lumber spaced out every 16 inches. This spacing allowed for sufficient strength to hold up a second story or a roof. Placing the lumber any closer together would be a waste of wood and money. Spacing it out any further would be a compromise to the structural integrity of the building. This 16 inch cavity allows builders to place insulation in the voids to minimize the heat that would otherwise be transferred from outside to inside. But there is a problem because as effective as the insulation is, it turns out wood isn't exactly a good insulator and becomes the part of the wall that conducts the most heat from outside to inside. Conduction is the heat transfer that happens from the outer building material, either stucco or wood siding to the wood framing and finally into the interior drywall. So insulation, good, bad, wood. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> so insulation, good, wood, bad. This is the driving factor for modern builders to switch from two x four lumber to two x six lumber, which most modern homes are built with. This extra wood allows buildings in certain places where building codes permit to use larger spacing from 16 to 24 inches, which means more of the wall is filled with insulation and less of it is wood. Plus, by going from four to six inches in thickness, there's 50% more insulation depth, further improving the thermal insulation of the wall. To better understand why houses are designed the way they are, let's look at some of the stresses your houses are subjected to. One, compression and tension. Two, shear. Three, bending. Four, torsion. Compression and tension are easy to understand and are the biggest factors in building a home. When designing a house, we have to consider the whole weight of the house, the second story, the roof, and then make sure we provide enough two by fours or two by sixes to handle that weight with a safety margin. Tension is the opposite, a pulling force. Then there's shear, which is a sliding force. With shear, you've probably seen that most houses have a particle board wall along with the two by fours. And that's because without it, the shear of a house would allow it to just fall apart and fold flat on itself. A shear wall helps to prevent this. With a boxable modular home, things are quite different. Uh, so I'm Kyle Denman. I'm the director of engineering. I'm um, one of the uh, founders along with uh, Paolo and Galliano Tiramani. And uh, yeah, uh, at the end of the day, they're my designs that get made. So We're on maybe our 20th iteration of design. Uh, it's, it's really changed a lot. Um, and the goal is always to come up with the strongest, uh, most manufacturable, and best cost solution. Um, so we actually had the original design was a kind of stick frame version uh, and then we found uh, SIPs, structurally insulated panels, as an alternate design because it's more suited for manufacturing because um, you can just laminate panels very quickly and you end up with a really, really strong structure that's very lightweight. So for their size, a six inch wall that's 20 feet long and nine foot tall, uh, we're about two times stronger in uh, uh, transverse and sheer loading than traditional construction would be. Wow. And axial were pretty similar. Wall insulations are measured in R ratings, where the larger the number, the better the insulation. But there's a problem with how traditional homes are measured, because if R32 insulation was installed in your wall, that would be the rating that it would take. But that doesn't account for the fact that the wood framing is nowhere near R32, and as a result, holistic insulation value of the entire wall would be much lower. In contrast, the box of the wall doesn't have this issue. The wall is uniform and the insulation spans the entire structure. This means that an R20 wall on a boxable home is far more insulated than the R20 wall in a traditional home. 
Combine all of this with the fact that these walls can be mass produced one after another in their factory and the impressive list of benefits comes clearly into focus. Cheaper, faster to build, stronger and better insulated. If we're serious about solving some of our housing shortages, this approach is most assuredly going to factor in. High-end homes will continue to be built the way they are, but there is no way we can provide affordable housing for millions without rethinking the very way homes are built. Boxable homes can fit on standard trucks since they're about 8.5 feet wide, and once they land at the site, setup takes just hours. You don't need to schedule plumbers and cabinet makers or anything else. Now, Boxable is still a startup. They've iterated on their design numerous times to get to this point. They're just starting to build out their factory, and we were one of the first to see their new space. In the coming months, they'll need to complete the build out and get to the hard work of scaling up manufacturing. They will face their share of challenges. For one, they are trading customization in the interest of mass production. Anyone looking for a special custom home will have to continue to get it built the old fashioned way. But it's important to note that boxable modules can be connected together like Lego bricks. Start with a studio casita and then add a room or two later when you've saved up. Also, as easy to transport as boxable modules are, they will face issues with shipping costs the further away customers are. So as they grow, they'll have to start building future factories closer to their end customers. This will be a delicate balance and a business model limitation they're gonna to have to manage carefully. But as cool as all of that is, here's what has me the most excited. Whatever we come up with to help us with fast, scalable affording housing here on Earth will be the very things that will help us colonize Mars. Let me take a step back and explain. Colonizing Mars is one of the ultimate chicken or the egg problems. We need secure covered spaces to truly build out a colony on Mars. But what might the first settlements look like? Well, close your eyes and imagine this. In the near future, starships or other super heavy, reusable, long range spacecraft get loaded up with modular homes that are fully built that can fold up into a compact footprint. They then take to the stars and make the long multi-month voyage to Mars. Maybe we need some special equipment or compressed air cartridges that can be deployed to unfold the homes and settle them into their foundation. It could be possible to send five to 10 module homes at a time per launch per craft. Coordinate a launch of 10 starships at a time and suddenly you're looking to add 50 to 100 homes per mission to our colony on Mars. These early settlements will give us the ability to house critical personnel, begin to create laboratories, machine shops, and other critical infrastructure. This, I believe, is exactly how the early days of Mars colonization will look like. If you'd like to watch more videos about exactly how a modular house built on Earth might tackle Mars problems like radiation, let me know and I'll add it to our list and try to make it soon. Well, that pretty much does it for us here at a look at modular homes and in Boxable in particular. I'm really excited. I think we need to reimagine some of these problems if we're going to really tackle the housing crisis that we have. A huge thank you to all of our viewers and a special thank you to all of our 2-Bit Tribe members who are on Patreon as a patron or our YouTube channel members. So come chat with us, help us write scripts, plan future videos, and be a part of the team. All for a small monthly fee that helps to support the show. All right, well, that pretty much does it. Take a look around. There are going to be videos that I think you're going to like. So until next time, I'm Ricky with Tuba Da Vinci, and remember, the future is going to be awesome.